Hello, everyone. Hi for everyone here in the audience uh, physically in Brussels, and hello for everyone joining us remotely from all over the world. Um, around nearly 400 of you are with us today online, so thanks a lot for coming in. And welcome to the Young Experts Conference. I'm Rossi Abirafa. I'm an economist from Toulouse. I'm doing a postdoc in London at the IFS, and I will be your host today along with Despina Gupu. Hi, Despina. Kalimera. Roshi, quite impressed by your knowledge in Greek, and welcome everyone. Thank you. Um, she's flattering me. I don't speak Greek. Um, so today uh, you're going to be listening to uh, the voices of young experts in the competition community, and basically you're going to hear what keeps them up at night when they're thinking about competition policy 10 years from today. The exercise was not easy. So imagine we took young and smart, rigorous scholars and practitioners, and we basically gave them a somewhat mystical mandate. We told them that they had to think through solutions to problems that are not there yet in a world that doesn't yet exist. And honestly, they succeeded, didn't they, Despina? Absolutely. Yeah. So we're very glad to be here, and we're very glad to present these panelists for you. The program to today is going to be centered around two uh, panels with three young experts each. Um, you're going to have two breaks. During the breaks, you're going to have the opportunity to actually hear and listen to three other young experts who pre-recorded videos for us. Um, our commissioner will open the, the show, and Director General uh, Gerson will, close, uh, will give the closing remarks. Before I give the, um, our commissioner the floor, let me just give you a heads up uh, about uh, something that matters for you. So you're going to have the chance to interact with us. And if you're joining us remotely through, through the online platform, you can basically send us your question by typing them on the right-hand side of the screen. If you are with us in the audience room today, then you can just raise your hand and uh, someone will come to you with a microphone, so it should be easy. And before giving the floor, I'd like to thank direct the DigiComp for giving the impetus for this conference today, and the members of, of the scientific committee, including Despina, who repeatedly woke up at 5 a.m. to make this happen. So thanks a lot. And Commissioner Vestager, please, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, and a warm welcome uh, to everyone. I can, of course, only second it because Basically, I'm a, I'm a guest here, and I'm really, really happy to be invited. Because uh, some of you are here in Brussels, some are joining from the rest of Europe, or even from the rest of the world. And when I looked at the list of participants earlier on, uh, one thing was really striking, and that was how diverse today's event uh, is. Uh, you come from 47 countries, representing not just legal practice, governments and academics, but also industry and civil society. You are economists, you are lawyers, you are IT architects, finance specialists, uh, you are gender balanced and you are ethnically diverse. Above all, there is one thing that unites you, you will define the future of competition policy. And that is exciting. And uh, I would forgive everyone for being sort of a bit, wow, have I, have I bitten off a too big bite uh, of this? After all, the world is changing. It's changing hard, it's changing fast. There are things out there that we don't know of. And also, you know, the 20th century ideas of how to run an economy without uh, too much attention to the resources being used, that idea is completely outdated. It's over. We do not see the world the same way. Even the way we think uh, of the economy is a legacy of the 20th uh, century with goods on one hand, with services on the other. We know that's outdated because we miss uh, a new central element, and that is data, that integrate the two, the products and the services, in ways that we wouldn't know of just five, ten years ago. Uh, 
Competition policy has served us well. Uh, it's a big part of the success of the Europe's single market. But as the world changes, new really pressing issues, well, they emerge. Fighting climate change, uh, digitizing our societies. And they're just not, not just new issues. They're real game changers. The change is the way we think, the way we act, and the way we act together. And whatever the economy looks like, there can be no doubts that information and resource efficiency, well, that will be key concepts. That means that they must be at the heart of competition policy as well. Already, our work has changed in ways I would not have imagined when I started in public policy now quite some time ago. So what are we looking at? Where are we in 2030? Or maybe even before? Will changes accelerate? What questions should we ask to be able to find out what will happen? Because change is not something that just happened accidentally. Change is people thinking, discussing, taking action. And this, of course, is why this conference is so important. To give ourselves just some credit, as said, uh, we here in the European Commission realize that we are not the best place to answer the questions, and maybe not even the best place to ask the right ones. And this is why this conference is designed the way it is. As, um, as part of the Year of Youth, the European Commission is uh, pursuing what we call youth policy dialogue. And that will go on in a number of areas, including here in competition policy. And it's also a contribution to the Conference of the Future of the European Union. And the point is that the Commission, we want more than just a dialogue with you. We want dialogue by you by young people. Um, in 2019 and 2021, we hosted conferences on uh, the role of digital in competition and on greening uh, competition, respectively. Uh, as part of those events, we launched two student uh, challenges. We thought contribution from young experts uh, in the field of competition policy. And the response was overwhelming. So many found this sufficiently intriguing to take the efforts to think, to discuss, to write, and because of that, to enable action. Uh, the quality of the contributions was so high that anyone who may have doubts of, uh, of the young generation should just sit down and read these contributions and that lack of hope will be completely cured because it was great. And that is why uh, today's conference has been designed by eight winners of those challenges who accepted our invitations to be part of the Independent Scientific Committee. From the choice of topic, to the choice of speakers, to the innovative of open way of structuring uh, the discussion, this is your conference. And you did this yourself. Uh, the nine speakers today represent a wealth of talent, a breadth of insights. They, I think they complement each other professionally. Uh, and I was also, maybe obviously, pleased to see that uh, a majority uh, are, wom are women. Uh, I can tell you that this is nothing. It would never have happened in the beginning of my career. And also, it doesn't happen every time. So it's a good thing. And when I looked at the choice of topics for the two panels, well, I don't think we would have chosen these topics uh, if it was sort of an in-house conference, if we had been thinking about this ourselves. And that is exactly the point. And that is good. When you think about it, I think both themes, they strike uh, at the heart at where we're headed. The first panel 
on how to expand the powers of competition authorities, well, that opens many doors um, to questions on, on the nature of enforcement and the nature of the future economy in itself. And I think it's the right question to ask. What is the role? What should we do? What powers should we have? Second panel on competition policy and artificial intelligence, just as important. Um, no one can doubt how the widespread deployment of, uh, of AI will change economic relationships, how companies compete, how authorities enforce, well, even what kind of rules are needed, how consumers see the market, their ability to make choices. I shouldn't say spend more time speaking. We're here to listen, to learn, to learn about the direction of what we do and how, where we could take it in the coming years, in the coming decade. It may be that we don't get all the answers today. After all, there are really many moving parts as we speak. And the future is, as they say, hard to predict. But uh, anyone with a crystal ball, of course, more than welcome, I don't have one. Still, I'm willing to make just one prediction. Whatever the future holds for competition policy, I'm, there's one thing I'm sure about, and that is that it will look just like you. Thank you very much and a warm welcome. Thank you so much, Commissioner, for this encouraging speak, speech. Thank you. So I believe now we have uh, time for a few questions from the scientific committee and uh, the panelists. So just before we jump into the questions, um, I want to thank again the scientific committee because we've been working very hard since April. Specifically, so you're going to have the chance to see and hear some of them later during the day, but uh, some of us are going to stay in the background today, so I want to thank them now. So specifically, David Perez de Lamo, thank you. Uh, he is a uh, uh, lawyer, an associate at uh, Cleary Gottlieb. So I want to thank him because he's not going to be able uh, to be on camera today with us. So thank you, David. And now I believe uh, time for a question from Despina, right? Thanks, Rossi, And thank you very much, Ms. Pestager, for your thought-provoking speech. Uh, as you mentioned, the world is changing. Uh, in this context, the debate around the objectives of competition policy has been renewed. So my question is, in case Competition policy encompasses broader objectives, such as achieving sustainable development. Do you believe that there is a risk that competition policy may end up being inefficient in achieving the initial objective of consumer welfare standard, and thus in achieving lower consumer prices, which are, of course, always desirable? I definitely think that there is a risk. Uh, depending on what we do. And uh, in these days where we, we discuss a lot about competition and innovation, competition being the most important driver for innovation, for me, it's, it's really important uh, to keep, you know, as part of our job, that for, for many people, also uh, goods and services being affordable is important. If you're on a small budget, well, it really makes a difference. So it's important that we have sort of this broad scope of what we do. So it's prices, quality, uh, choice, uh, innovation, that we have this broad perspective when we look at what competition should achieve. And I also think that the, the fundamental driver, also when it comes to sustainability, is for the market to work. So that every business would have um, the right incentive to use as few resources as possible to be as efficient as possible, for instance, in energy use, um, but also that to some degree competition is a subcontractor. If, uh, if our, our elected politicians, they want more animal welfare or they want different emission standards, they should legislate. They should legislate, put a frame on to say, within this framework of rules, go compete. Uh, that being said, I still think it's important that, that we find the right balance um, 
I'm, I'm not ready to take the full step to say that it doesn't matter that consumers in market are hurt because of out of market consumers, uh, they get a benefit. But I think we could, in our assessment, we could look at what kind of benefit for the in market uh, consumers to be faced with. I think it's really important that we have this sort of mental balance that we should not suffer the fundamental drivers that makes the market work for, for something that where well, we don't know yet. But, uh, but we'll see because I, I hope that eventually someone will actually bring cases because that's the most, most important thing to make us think. That is specific cases on ground, businesses who want to do something. Thank you very much. Thank you, Despina. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, I believe we have a question. So just a reminder also, if you're joining us remotely, you can ask us questions on Slido. Just go on the right-hand side of your screen. You can type in your question, and it will appear to us, and we'll ask it later on. Um, for now, I think we have a question from Anna Popovic. Um, Anna is a PhD candidate uh, at University of Anders, Amsterdam in economics, and a member also of the scientific committee. Uh, Anna, would you like to ask your question? Um, hello, and uh, thank you, Digicom, for the amazing opportunity and uh, the organization. My question is, uh, so we saw during the COVID pandemic how important the flexible and uh, strong um, communication from the Commission was, and we expect that those a flexible and adaptable communication and regulation is going to play an important role in uh, achieving the twin goals of digital and green. So my question was, what is the biggest challenge that you see coming forward in imp actually implementing this flexible regulation and what can we do about it or what can the Commission do about it? That's my question. I think right now we are uh, not only uh, sort of enabling uh, in the state aid framework uh, member states to help businesses who've been suffering from, from state restriction during the pandemic. We've also had you know, uh, guidelines to enable businesses to cooperate uh, more during the pandemic, for instance, in providing necessary uh, forms of medication. Also, we are revising basically everything we have. We, we just finalized a new set of guidelines for uh, climate change, uh, environmental production, protection and energy. Uh, we have our broadband guidelines uh, out for consultation. Uh, we have the vertical block exemption regulation, the horizontal block exemption regulation, all to be updated. And of course, we updated with a view to what is happening in digitization, uh, sort of the market uh, changing, what happens, how data is being used to make sure that competition rules are fit for purpose. The thing is, of course, then for, for market participants to see, okay, something new has happened. And I do hope that our consultations to somehow, you know, uh, pave the way, prepare the mind for, for changes to come so that there is a sense of, okay, something new is happening. We want to do this. Because we cannot develop the exact use of our guidelines or our case practice without businesses coming to us. And, and there is one thing in, in specific, also following up on the last question, we would very much like to discuss with businesses what kind of cooperation they would want to have. But it seems as if they are a bit no, they will probably say no, so we don't even bother. And we really try to encourage, and, and the latest encouragement was when we had a, a cartel decision on a number of car producers uh, colluding on uh, not competing on, on making the, most, the cleanest car, but agreeing only to apply sort of the legal standard uh, of emission. We saw that their cooperation was not only on that illegal side, it was also on something completely legitimate, like uh, safety standards, for instance. So what we did was that we had the finding decision, and then we also wrote sort of a, a letter saying all of this perfectly fine. And that, of course, is public, so that uh, businesses can see, okay, this is how they're thinking. They, do, they have the glasses to see when we do something that is pro-competitive, that enhances the market, just as well as they have the glasses to see when something actually is illegal. Thank you so much. 
for the question and the answer, Commissioner. I think now, just to keep uh, the balance with the remote participants, we have a couple of questions from our remote participants. Maybe we can uh, ask a question of these. Mm -hmm. We have a couple of interesting questions. So the first one is about the DMA. And specifically, the DMA seems to assume fir firms sit on data mountains, but they increasingly use new methods to target on their terms without data leaving devices. Are we ready? I, I need it once again. Could you say it once again? Definitely. The DMA seems to assume firms sit on data mountains, but they increasingly use new methods to target on their terms without data leaving devices. Are we ready? Well, that's uh, exactly what, uh, what we're thinking about, because we also see this development that you don't, do not necessarily just gobble up data, put it in a pile and use it for your own benefit. You also leave it on the edge, uh, in the car, in the device, wherever, because it's so much faster. Uh, and also it's not as energy intensive because you don't have to have data travel uh, all the way to the cloud, you just use it where it is. And I think that some of the provisions to enabling data access actually do not distinguish between access to a mountain or a pile of data or access where data is created. Uh, really interesting, of course, when you talk about automotive, uh, because here you have many, many subcontractors. You have firms who would want to uh, innovate on, on, on tires, so that also tires and, and wheels digitalize uh, in order to get better information about when they're being used, what is the problem uh, depending on the conditions of the road. Uh, and they would want to have some of the data from the vehicle. And if that is on the edge or in the cloud, as long as they get access, they, I don't think they care so much. Thank you very much. Uh, so the second question from our remote participants from Slido is quite different. Uh, is about some economic sectors that are still close to competition. And for example, um, one uh, remote participant mentions that our union lacks European TV channels, a gap filled by American streaming platforms. Will the market open up to these possibilities sometime in the near future? On TV channels? Mm -hmm. Well, I think we took some steps in, in, uh, in the last uh, mandate, uh, at least for, for people to be able to see uh, other countries' TV channels, to do away with uh, unjustified geo-blocking. Uh, because we could see in the market that there is quite a demand uh, to see uh, TV channels from other countries. I think one of the, the barriers for sort of a, a pan-European uh, TV network or, or TV channel is indeed cultural and, uh, and language. So it's not necessarily market barriers. I think the barriers, they are more cultural. Uh, they are more sort of language prone. Uh, also because you have different traditions. You know, in, in my country, everything would be subtitled. In other countries, they would want everything to be dubbed. So, you know, I would be happy to see, uh, see a series from another country with uh, maybe automatic subtitling. Uh, but in another country, that may not work at all because they're used to only hearing things in their own language. So I think, well, we need to work not only on, on enabling uh, sort of cross-border sales uh, for uh, providers of, uh, of series or films or documentary, whatever, but also ourselves to work on our approach actually to, to look for it and to seek for it um, in order to have a broader view in, than what is presented from Netflix or HBO or uh, or Disney or any of the others. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think we have a couple of minutes left. Maybe a good time if people in the audience with us in Brussels want to ask a question. I see a hand raised. Do you mind presenting also yourself before you speak? Can I have a take of my mask? Keep it on? Okay. I hope I'm still... Uh, understand me. Um, so hi, I'm Herman. Um, I'm not actually a competition lawyer, lawyer. I'm a programmer. So I'm going to ask something about the digital stuff, the Digital Services uh, Digital Markets Act. Sorry. Um, and what I noticed is that the Digital Markets Act, I think it's a great idea to make these uh, kind of rules, but uh, for the gatekeeper platforms. But mostly it seems that it's just trying to make the gatekeepers behave more nicely to have kind gatekeepers, whereas we could have no gatekeepers at all, and it sounds much more preferable, because we only have gatekeepers because there are gates. We only have gates because those platforms make walled gardens. 
And I wonder why doesn't competition law and the DMA focus more on breaking open those walls by, for example, imposing interoperability obligations um, on such big platforms. And um, I've seen the, the European Parliament has made amendments to do that for, um, uh, for messaging platforms and social media. And I wonder if the European Commission will continue, and maybe also after the DMA, to uh, do more in this direction. Because as long as you have to choose the same app as someone else chooses in order to communicate with each other, I don't see how we can ever get fair competition. As if, if I cannot transfer you money if you choose a different bank than I do, well, then you cannot get competition between banks. If I have to choose the same phone as you do, to call you, then we, we don't have free choice in our phones or telecom providers. So why don't we uh, have the ambition to make all digital markets in uh, such a yeah, more free markets? Because otherwise you have monopolies by design, in a way. Well, it's, it's one of the questions that we, we asked ourselves when we designed uh, the Digital Markets Act. Uh, because interoperability is already something that can be obliged uh, on companies in the telecommunication code. So actually, to some degree, the Commission would already have uh, some of the powers to do this. It's not with me, it's uh, with my colleague Thierry Breton. Uh, uh, and so far, they have not found reasons to use these provisions. Uh, we have asked for... Uh, or proposed uh, to Parliament and Council interoperability in a number of instances, but not as a blanket provision that everything should be interoperable. Uh, and the reason why we have not done that is because that we think that it's also fair enough that something has distinction, that something can, can be different from other things. Uh, if you look at uh, messaging services, uh, like text messages, for decades, basically, there was no innovation. It was just the same thing. It took the specific newcomers to enable uh, photos, uh, videos, uh, sound, uh, new ways of, uh, of messaging one another before things actually happened. Uh, as you say, the European parliaments uh, are very focused on interoperability and it will be an essential part uh, of the discussion to see how can it serve uh, that consumers get more choice uh, and that businesses get better options. Because interoperability is indeed one of the keys, uh, not only to unlock gates, but also for walls uh, to come down. So in that respect, I don't think that we're too far apart. Uh, I think all depending on should it be, as we have suggested, sort of in a number of areas, or should it be sort of a blanket provision? Okay. Thank you so much. Sadly, so I'm the host. I'm resp responsible for keeping the time. This has been so enjoyable. Uh, so sadly, we can't take more questions. Uh, thanks a lot for being with us, for giving the energy for this, uh, for this conference to happen, but also for the open-mindedness with which you came uh, to be with us today. So thanks a lot for that.